Present. Commissioner Freeman. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Present. Commissioner Norton. Commissioner or Representative Przanski. Oh, here's Norton in the. Hello, Commissioner Norton. And then Representative Lewis. And then Chair Solomon. Present. All right, we do have quorum. Wonderful. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is the first meeting of 2024 of the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission. Um, we will start the meeting with, um, well, actually, before we engage, did we have anybody sign up for public comment today? Ken or Carol? I do no. not have any public comment. Okay. Looks like the, the first item on our agenda is the street racing and addiction JAG proposal. And I see we have uh, District Attorney Schmidt and Chief Day here with us. Welcome. And Ken, were you going to uh, kick this off or turn it over to um, our, our guests? Um, I, I think that we have our guests uh, queued up, and so I, I'd kick it right over to uh, uh, to DA Schmidt and uh, Chief Day. Um, if you wouldn't mind coming back to me at the end, though, uh, Chair, then that would be wonderful. You bet. Thank you. Yeah, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Great. <clears throat> well, I'll I'll lead us off, and then uh, Chief Day will will back clean up. Uh, thank you all for uh, taking the time to hear this. Request. My name is Mike Schmidt. I'm the Multnomah County District Attorney. It's so good to see so many of you. And also, oddly enough, I'm coming to you live from the CJC. Uh, so the call is literally coming from within the house. Uh, but it's good to be back uh, and see you all today. Um, our proposal, our request to you is to consider using $100,000 in burden JAG dollars to help uh, the Portland Police Bureau on an issue that has been uh, very prevalent in our community uh, really for uh, as long as I've been the district attorney the last three years probably predates that somewhat but I think the pandemic um, really saw an increase in street racing um, <clears throat> I was uh, privileged and, and grateful to Chief Day and his team uh, to go on a ride along New Year's Eve night uh, and I went with the uh, commander of North Precinct and so I got to see firsthand uh, the street racing events, the takeovers, and what they do um, to our community and to our streets. Um, you know, probably uh, some of you or, or all of you have read news coverage and articles about community members that talk about uh, being unable to, uh, you know, use the roads leading up and out of their own homes. Um, at these events, we see people get injured. Uh, my office has had to respond to homicides that are a result of these events. Uh, dealing with um, guns. We see a lot of guns that are accompanying these events. Uh, we see that they involve, sometimes we've seen, um, you know, looting of uh, local businesses that, that are being surrounded by these events. They have major impact. You know, it can sound like a trivial thing. Uh, I don't think anyone on this call probably believes that they're trivial at all. But, you know, when you say, oh, people are doing donuts in the street, that can sound trivial. Uh, but that's really not at all what this is. Um, this is a, a big event that happens and it pops up in different parts of our community and has major public safety impacts on uh, the folks who live uh, in the city of Portland. So like I said, I was uh, privileged to go with the Portland Police Bureau on a ride along on New Year's Eve night. Um, we had no less than three different uh, street racing takeovers happen in the span of four or five hours. And as I was talking to the commander about our ability to interdict this behavior, one of the things that he mentioned to me was the costs of uh, doing these types of enforcement actions. Um, I got to see the police officers deploying uh, stop strips. Uh, so the strips that you would put in front of a vehicle in order to um, you know, disable the tires uh, so that they could no longer continue to do that type of activity. Uh, and I will tell you that they, I don't know how many they ended up deploying that night, but I think they were running out of them because they were having to share them between the cars uh, of different officers to be able to um, handle the volume of the street racing uh, that we saw. Um, I got to see a couple, in a couple situations, uh, vehicles be pitted 
uh, who were attempting to elude uh, police officers dangerously. This was New Year's Eve night, like I mentioned. People are out, people are driving, people are uh, frequenting, uh, you know, locations uh, where they are drinking alcohol and out on the sidewalks. And you see these cars going 60, 80 miles an hour. Uh, so when officers were able to safely uh, do it, they were able to uh, interdict some of these drivers by pitting them. That also uh, increases costs of the enforcement actions. And then, of course, just the personnel costs, the, the overtime costs uh, that are born on the agency to get people to be able to come out and, and do it because uh, you don't just need a couple officers. You need a lot of officers to be available to safely be able to uh, have an enforcement kind of radius around these events so that you don't just have people zooming down neighborhood streets at 100 miles an hour. Um, so it really takes a large amount of force. So talking to the commander from North Precinct, you know, he was telling me they were able to do this action, but he didn't know how many he'd be able to do during the year just because of all of the costs uh, that come to him and, and his budget to be able to do these. Uh, and so I approached the governor's office. Uh, as you all know, Governor Kotek is very interested in helping the city of Portland, uh, you know, uh, reestablish uh, public safety as much as we can and, and to continue to work on improving public safety. Uh, the governor was uh, interested in partnering with us on this idea. And so I'm bringing to you today, uh, asking for you to, to help us be able to bring more of these enforcement actions in our community by helping uh, the Portland Police Bureau just have uh, a little bit of additional funding to be able to conduct more of these missions. Uh, like I say, they really do have a, a pretty big public safety impact on our streets. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chief Bob Day, who's gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, his agency and the costs and, and what he thinks that just a, a small grant like this could do for our ability to, to keep our streets uh, even safer. Uh, thanks, Mike, and uh, thanks everyone for having us here and for considering this proposal. My name is Bob Day, I'm the Chief of Police for the City of Portland. And uh, came into this job, as you may be aware, just a few months ago and uh, had heard a lot about this problem that we've been facing. And frankly, the uh, police bureau had been at a loss for a number of years to really figure out a way to identify and address it. And uh, so in 2023, we began some initiatives uh, for the first time and have had some limited success, uh, if I can characterize it as such. The downside is because we have not had much of an enforcement approach over the last couple of years, frankly, Portland's become a destination. Uh, there's been some uh, West Coast advertised events held here. There's some being promoted on social media in the coming months. Um, we see a lot of our contacts now are from people from out of state telling us that we know that they we have not been enforcement oriented, that the accountability is low, specifically around towing and criminal prosecution, which thanks to DA Schmidt and others is changing now since the first of the year. But um, and then geographically, we just have some really large isolated industrial areas, which, as the district attorney mentioned, might seem like just kids having fun. But uh, we've had at least two fatal crashes in 2023 as a result of speed racing uh, and these street takeovers. We don't know there could be others because, you know, once they disperse, but their driving doesn't, their driving behavior doesn't change as they leave these places at high speeds. We follow them on with our airplane and it's not as if the police involvement uh, initiates a higher level of speed. They continue to drive erratically. Um, we've had nearly a thousand calls for service, about 775 or so uh, that we've tied to, you know, street racing from concerned constituents, um, some who are like we've mentioned are trapped either on the freeway or businesses that are being uh, looted. Uh, we had a 7-Eleven over on 82nd that was just decimated when they took over an intersection near a 7-Eleven and lost thousands of dollars worth of merchandise and the police couldn't get into the area to literally address it because it was so such a significant impact. Uh, we did four missions in 2023, began to address some of this 2023 into 24 as the one Mike mentioned, uh, made a number of arrests. Uh, we have recovered nine firearms during those four missions. So these are not just uh, you know, kids driving fast. In fact, they're, you know, not really kids. A lot of them are young adults and and um, and older. And so, you know, the the um, the firearms being in the equation, obviously highly concerning. And we're making a concerted effort in the city around gun violence and trying to reduce our gun violence. So we've uh, towed a few cars now, once again, thanks to the new laws changes. And even the event that we did on New Year's Eve, 
we, as we monitored social media for the first time, we're seeing comments from some of these participants about, hey, you know, the police are serious. Hey, the police this and that. So, you know, really the words already starting to get out. But as uh, Mike mentioned, you know, as with everything, I, I talk about resources or time, people and money. And I know that uh, we're all short of all three. So I appreciate you considering the request. These missions, a, a, an average size mission, which is limited, we we, we really uh, try to be physically responsible is about 10 grand. So that's uh, for overtime and for equipment like the stop strips that were mentioned and others. But that's for basically a smaller, like this is the minimum we need to do is about 10 grand. Uh, as resources come online and if we had the money, some of these events we know that are coming are going to be much larger in scale and we'd like to obviously hire more personnel so that's where some of the additional uh, funding would come from but it's basically about a ten thousand dollar event um, give or take uh, it depending on the the size and scope of what we're trying to address so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an overview and what the need is and the priority for it it does factor directly into my effort around you know reducing crime and the fear of crime is one of our priorities. And as I said, it ties into a lot of other initiatives around community involvement and engagement, you know, servicing our community around gun violence, et cetera. But have been answer any more questions. I know we're on a on a time frame here. Anything I missed, Mike, feel free to add in. Great. Thank you, Chief Day D. A. Schmidt. Um, looks like Commissioner Freeman, you have a question or thought. Well, well, thank you, and I appreciate you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Chief Day. I appreciate you bringing this issue forward. Uh, just a quick question. You, you, you are asking for this money in an effort to have more law enforcement. Um, is there any issue or consideration around the prosecution side of criminals? I'm just curious, is there going to be a commitment if you go do your work and arrest these people or cite them or do whatever you're going to do, is the DA's office going to have the resources necessary to prosecute them for the crimes they're committing. That's why I got the DA here. <laughs> we stood and had yeah. this conversation on New Year's Eve, so I'll let him address it. Yeah, thank you, Chief and, and Commissioner Freeman. Yeah, so as the district attorney here asking for this resource, uh, I think you could probably uh, infer that my commitment is that I am taking these events very seriously for our community. Uh, like I said, I was out there myself with the police officers. So we are prosecuting these cases. Uh, and I think our goal, and we had three other deputy DAs out that night with me uh, on this event. So it wasn't just me either. Uh, we're dedicating resources to this work as well. And I'm not asking for any funds for my office uh, to do this work. Uh, but yes, uh, we are working with police as we do on all things. And I might mention, because uh, I can sense an undertone in your question, that our prosecution rates are as high as they've been in the last seven and eight years uh, for cases coming to us from local law enforcement agencies, both misdemeanors and felonies. Uh, so prosecution is not an issue in Multnomah County, and I look forward to working with Chief Day uh, when we get these cases and using the new law to be able to, uh, when people, when it's appropriate, uh, consider forfeiting uh, the vehicles that are engaged in this type of activity. So I hope you didn't hear any tone in my voice that wasn't there. Here in Douglas County, we have not enough resources to always prosecute because of the lack of timber receipt. It was an honest question to make sure that we weren't funding law enforcement officers to create more demand than your office could take care of. And the fact you might need some extra resources is what the question was around. Ah, I appreciate that, Commissioner Freeman. Thank you for that. And uh, apologies if I was reading too much into the comment. I deal with a lot of claims that prosecution doesn't happen in Multnomah County. So maybe I'm a little bit attuned to that when uh, when I think the, the women and men in my office are doing fantastic work in carrying heavy caseloads. But I appreciate your local circumstances. Thanks for, for uh, humoring me on that. Great. Um, I have a question about um, the sustainability of these interventions. This is um, these JAG grant funds are, are one time monies that that'll be allocated for specific interventions and um given that this money isn't going to go a long way at 10 grand a pop 
I'm curious about your ability to leverage other resources or ways that you're thinking about potentially sustaining this level of intervention. Yes, sir. Uh, Bob, let me real quick and then I'll hand it to you. Um, I've had conversations with some of the city uh, commissioners and let them know that, uh, you know, we'd be making this request on behalf of PPB to you all today and that uh, I'd like to see them put forward a proposal to, uh, you know, match the funds that you're committing to this to augment Bob's uh, resources, the chief's resources. Uh, I had that conversation with uh, Commissioner Rubio. Uh, she was enthusiastic about that. She knows that these events impact our community safety. So I think um, there's conversations. Obviously, they're going through their budget process right now, um, but they're they're interested in, in augmenting and leveraging your resources. The only other thing I would mention in terms of sustainability is it's both chief days and my hope that by doing some of these uh, events and, and doing them in, in good force, we're already starting to get some of the word out that you don't want to come to Multnomah County or to Portland to do this. And it's both of our belief that in this type of an event, uh, that enforcement can have a good deterrent event from having other types like this show up and pop up. So my hope is that we'll see a decrease of these types of street takeovers by having strong enforcement efforts. Go ahead, Chief. Uh, I want to echo that in regards to the budget question. Yes, we're in those conversations now. My strategy to get us through the end of this fiscal year and in the next fiscal year is we're going to continue to look at ways to manage our funds so that we can commit to not just these missions, but other missions that we're using specifically to target these high impact events that are uh, harming our community. So, you know, it's very much in the back of my mind about sustainability and not just a one off. And I would agree with the DA's comments that. You know, not just around enforcement, probably a lot lost on any of us, but if you're a young person that's put 70, 80, $100,000 into your car and we take it and we don't just tow it because we're going to keep it overnight, but we tow it because we're going to go through the civil forfeiture process. There are a lot of these young people that are heavily invested in their vehicles. And now that they hear that they may not be seeing their vehicle again, unless it's being driven by a Portland police officer in a parade, um, they're having second thoughts about, you know, coming to the city and participating. So a um, bit of sarcasm there, but actually a lot of truth as well. So, but I hear you, sir, and I definitely am committed to, you know, sustainability and not just having this be a, a one-off. We need that consistency. All right. Um, if there aren't any other questions from commissioners, I'll kick it over to uh, Director Sanchegrin. And, and I don't see any other hands raised. I will be very brief. Um, uh, actually, D.A. Schmidt uh, covered most of what I was going to mention. I did want to at least put on the record that in conversations with the governor's office that as as D.A. Schmidt uh, stated, this is something that is a priority of the governor and uh, an important piece of her commitment within the uh, Central City Task Force. And so I wanted to reiterate that. And that's all I have to add. Thank you, Chair. Great. Um, well, this is an action item. So I would entertain a motion at this point if there's a commissioner willing to make it. Uh, commissioner Bovet. Um, uh, Chair, can I ask real, a real quick question? Then I'll probably make that motion. Uh, a real quick question of Ken. How how are we doing on burn jag? And I, I know we have a lot of it left over from previous years, but then we've been spending it down kind of selectively on on kind of one offs like this. Yeah. Um, but how are we looking financially? Um, that that is correct. Uh, we certainly can. Uh, we we could handle this level of funding um, very easily uh, within burn jag, um, as we've also noted um, a time or two. We have taken a slight change in our approach to our burn jag funding applications as uh, some burn jag funding has gone up over the past few years as well we've actually explicitly written in a portion of burn jag to be devoted to uh, one-off um, emergent issues within the state and so whether we put this in one of our old jag awards or whether we actually write it into the 23 jag that we just uh, that we just got last year we can certainly sustain that funding um, and so I'll leave it up to our operations staff to figure out the best place to put it. But yes, this is something that we can afford. Great. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate it. Before I yep. make a motion, I see a Commissioner Norton has a question or comment first. 
Yes, thank you. Um, and this is a question probably um, for staff. I was reviewing the 2024 um, information that was sent to us or the for the January meeting. I didn't see it in there. Did I miss where it was? Or am I missing a certain page that I should be looking on? I apologize. I'm looking for the budget and that kind of stuff. Uh, certainly, uh, Commissioner Norton, I apologize. This was something that came extraordinarily late in the process, and so we don't have a full memo for that in the materials. Um, but the ask is for $100,000. Uh, Chief Day has outlined the, the basic costs that, of course, can depend a little bit on the size of the intervention. Um, but yes, we, we, we always endeavor to put these in the packets, but uh, this one we added, I think, on uh, pretty much the day that we sent out the agenda. <laughs> okay, apologies. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, if you'd like me to make a motion, I'm happy to make one. Uh, uh, I'm, I actually, I was uh, on the agenda item. I, I had it in my head before, but I, I would make a motion to um, allocate up to $100,000 in Jagburn grant funds from the CJC to um, uh, this particular project in the city of Portland relating to um, traffic issues. Commissioner Bovet has made a motion. Is there a second to that motion? Or this is Commissioner Beach. All second. Great. We have a motion made by Vice Chair Bovet, uh, seconded by Commissioner Beach. Uh, Carol, would you mind taking roll? Of course, um, Commissioner Auxier. Um, abstain on this one. Commissioner Beach. Yes. Commissioner or Vice Chair Bovet. Yes. Commissioner Freeman. Yes. Commissioner McPherson. Yes. Commissioner Norton. Yes. And then Chair Solomon. Yes. So then it passes. Great. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Norton. Yes, thank you. I should have asked this before, but I was, yes. Um, I'm not sure what kind of reporting requirements are, but I would be interested to see, um, especially because they put so much information or like, they said that these cars are worth a lot. And if we, you know, is. I just want to see if that is this. Vice Chair Bovet is shaking his head, so he understands what I'm saying, and I'm sorry I can't make words. Yeah, it's it's a okay. Monday and I'm struggling with it, too, but I would actually like to see a report back on the results of this to see if it works, really. Yeah, indeed. Duly noted, we'll work with the county on that. And then also on the forfeiture side, um, we'll see how that shows up in our asset forfeiture data that we receive at the, at the commission on a, you know regularly. So we will work on both of those and re report back. Great. All right, uh, next up is uh, specialty court uh, implementation grant awards. And I believe Adeline is going to present. Yeah. Can you all see? We can now. Perfect. All right. Good afternoon, Chair Solomon, Commissioners. My name's Adeline Padlina, and I'm the Specialty Court Grant Coordinator. And today we'll be discussing the Specialty Court Grant funding decisions for the 23 to 25 Implementation Court Grant Program. So for the record, today's overall purpose is to provide final approval of funds for all applicants. So a quick review of what has been done so far and what you all will be doing today. So staff reviewed the applications for completeness and eligibility and then identified eligible funding requests as they relate to the solicitation. We'll have a whole slide about the solicitation. You'll hear me talk about it a lot today, but we want to make sure that those funding requests are related to it. So then the CJC brought that to the Grant Review Committee who evaluated their adherence to specialty court standards and the solicitation. They discussed the applications collaboratively and provided recommendations for funding requests to the grantees. And then they provided final funding recommendations, which I am bringing to you today. 
So you all as the commission are going to consider those funding recommendations made by the GRC and then make the ultimate funding decision on those applications. So let's talk about who is eligible for this grant. So to be an implementation specialty court grant T, they needed to be a new Oregon Circuit Court specialty court in the planning phase. And when I say new, I mean a court that was not previously in operation or has been operating for less than one year. So very, very, very new or has never done it before. Or they could be an existing Oregon Circuit Court focused on implementing or improving practices to adhere to the specialty court standards. And, and that's a big and, they did not receive any 23 to 25 specialty court grant program funding. So on top of that, to be considered for this implementation grant funding, they needed to use Oregon's specialty court management system, lovingly known as SCMS, they needed to include a treatment provider that accepts OHP, and they needed to agree to collaborate with the OJD specialty court team to receive technical assistance, program reviews, peer reviews, et cetera, as they became available. You're gonna see six applicants today, and all of them were deemed eligible by this criteria. And I promise we will get to them. But first, I want to talk a little bit about what eligible expenses means and how the Grant Review Committee and the staff at CJC deemed these eligible or not eligible. So long before we wrote the solicitation, the CJC coordinated with OJD and we asked the coordinators to help gauge interest in how many courts were going to be interested in applying for these grant funds. Turns out there was a ton of interest, which that's great. We had interest from over 10 participants. We ended up having six applicants. So then we're looking at a set amount of money, a lot of applicants. And so we went back to OJD and we said, hey, what is going to be the most helpful to these courts? What are the courts gonna need? And so in conjunction with OJD, the staff determined a coordinator and treatment services we're going to be the primary uses of funding that would support an implementation court in getting established and aligning their practices with standards. So therefore, this solicitation was incredibly specific. So per the solicitation, the funds awarded had to be used to support a court coordinator position that was again focused on that program's adherence to standards or they were going to offer treatment services through a treatment provider that aligns with best practices and again adherence to those standards. So any requests be that were made needed to be expressly and directly tied to these two things. Staff did not make any assumptions, so the request needed to be very clear as well. This was really in hopes of helping maintain equity for all the applicants. And then also it's really, really common to have underspending in new courts. So we were hoping to curb that. A couple additional um, regulations, I guess, that were made was that applicants could only request up to $150,000 of available CJC funds. And then finally, again, to, if to make sure that we are keeping true to that solicitation, the recommended training and travel requests were only for the court coordinator, and that was at a rate of $3,000 per person per conference per biennium, if that makes sense. And that was what we did for the larger specialty court grant earlier this year. I do want to note, though, whenever we start talking about Oh, eligible and uneligible expenses, people tend to get nervous. And so I just want to make it very clear that these implementation courts, like all the specialty courts, will be able to request further funding if there is a supplemental round. So if a request was not granted, they will again be eligible to ask again for it later if there is a supplemental round. Any questions about eligibility so far or our method methodology that we used? Excellent. So here was the recommended funding from the Grant Review Committee. You can see the six courts there, including Baker Mental Health Court, Clatsop Veterans Treatment Court, Josephine Family Treatment Court, Lynn Mental Health Court, Tillamook Family Treatment Court, and Washington Mental Health Court. 
there was total recommended funding of $474,495.85 with a total of $327,399.32 being allocated to OJD. If there aren't any questions, I will hand it back to Chair Solomon. Muted. Sorry about that. Um, are you able to articulate um, the allocations for Baker and Tillamook County? Um, the criteria that they didn't meet um, that um, kept them from getting the, the full uh, request? Sure. Um, so for we'll start with Baker County, if that's OK, for their mental health court. Um, I do want to note that for a couple, for four of the six courts, we did ask for additional information around some of the requests, and Baker was unfortunately the only one that didn't respond to that request for additional information. So some of the things that we, well, hang on, before I get into this, do you want me to go through what we didn't include as eligible, or do you want just an overview? What would you like? Yeah, How detailed just do you want? An overview would be great. Yeah, so... In both the case of Baker and Tillamook, Tillamook, they had some requests that were not directly tied to that treatment provider or treatment services or directly tied to that coordinator. So that really came down to any of the reductions that we recommended. We just kept going back to that solicitation. And if it wasn't in the solicitation and we didn't get additional information, then we didn't feel like it would be fair to recommend funding for it. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, them being funded in this implementation round um, would allow them to apply for funding in a regular round moving forward, correct? Correct, but they don't have to go through the implementation round to qualify for that in 25 to 27. Either way, we welcome everyone. Okay, and um, I just want to go back to that last slide um and make sure i understood correctly so the 327 um reflects the amount that's going for ojd staff um out of the 474,000 yeah so it was primarily for coordinators those were our biggest ask by far um there was some additional funding because the coordinators are being the ones sent to predominantly the All Rise Conference. So there's some training and travel in there as well, but predominantly predominantly for the coordinators. Okay, great. Um, any other questions from commissioners? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the recommendations for 2023-25 specialty court implementation grants as previously listed in the packet materials. This is Freeman, I'll make that motion. Great, is there a second? So that I'll second that motion. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner Freeman, seconded by Vice Chair Bovet. Um, if uh, Carol, you could take the roll. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Ogzier. Yes. Commissioner Beach. Yes. Vice Chair Bovet. Uh, yes. Commissioner Freeman. Yes. Commissioner McPherson? Yes. Commissioner Norton? Yes. And then Chair Solomon? Yes. And then it passes. All right, uh, next up is the um, formula grant for justice reinvestment, um, uh, the Jackson County uh, proposal. Uh, it looks like Ian, you're teed up and ready to go. Yep. Thank you, Chair Solomon. Um, so for the record, my name is Ian Davidson. I'm the Justice Reinvestment Program Manager, and we'll be talking about Jackson County's 
formula grant application. So um, this will be familiar to you. Um, just a quick overview. Um, the grant review committee met in October to make initial recommendations around justice reinvestment funding. You all met in November and uh, with particular attention to Jackson, you re referred Jackson County's formula grant application back to the grant review committee for reconsideration. They met on the 5th of January and they are recommending full funding for Jackson County. And we are now here today to consider that recommendation for full funding. Um, we conveyed to the grant review committee your direction that you provided to us in the November meeting. I won't go through this one by one, but I will just want to mention that we did communicate your wishes to the grant review committee. We also passed along the questions that you had put together for Jackson County. They did respond to those questions and then they submitted those materials for review to the grant review committee. Again, won't go through these one by one, but they reflect your wishes. And then uh, we are now uh, at a decision point. So the grant review committee is recommending unanimously to approve Jackson County's funding for the 23-25 biennium, which is a full two year funding. So here uh, you have two choices before you. You can either approve the grant review committee's recommendation or you could return the application for reconsideration by the grant review committee. Right, um, we'll open it up for discussion. It appears that uh, at least on the surface they have um, responded to the commission's request for additional information. Um, are there any concerns that commissioners have at this point that would lead us down a path of sending this back for reconsideration or are we ready to move forward to approve? And I see uh, Vice Chair Bovet, you've got your hand up. Um, uh, I just want to express um, my sincere thanks to the Grant Review Committee for looking at this again and, and coming up with what, what I think is the right answer. So I'm, I'm strongly supportive of this. And if the chair would like, I'm happy to put a motion on the floor or if you want to have more discussion. Um, and unless there are any other comments at this time, and I don't see any other hands up, uh, I would uh, love for you to make a motion. Uh, I would like to to move that we approve the 2325 Justice Reinvestment Formula Grant Award for Jackson County. This is Freeman. I'll second that. Right. We have a motion by Vice Chair Bobet, seconded by Commissioner Freeman. Uh, Carol, would you please take the roll? Commissioner Ogzier? Yes. Commissioner Beach? Yes. Vice Chair Bobet? Yes. Commissioner Freeman? Yes. Commissioner McPherson? Yes. Commissioner Norton? Yes. And Chair Solomon? Yes. Then it passes. Right. On to the uh, Justice Reinvestment uh, Competitive Grant Award protest from Multnomah County. Um, and Ian, I see you're up for that. And I just want to state, as I know we've got some folks from Multnomah County that are on the call today, that, that we won't be taking public comment at this time. But if folks want to submit written testimony for the record, we'd be happy to receive that. Um, Ian. Great. Thank you, Chair Solomon. Um, again, for the record, Ian Davidson, Justice Reinvestment Program Manager. And so um, we'll be talking about Multnomah County's protest, um, but before we get into the particulars of the protest, here's a quick overview of protests uh, in the context of the Criminal Justice Commission. So um, it is spelled out in our grant administration guide, which you can find at 3.1 under award protests, but here's the relevant section. An applicant may protest an award decision if the applicant is able to articulate specific reasons the application review or award processes were in error based on applicable law, rule, or specific language in the grant solicitation. And so the decision before you today is whether or not the protest from Multnomah County for the competitive grant articulates specific reasons that the application review or award process 
were an error based on applicable law, rule, or specific language in the grant solicitation. And I, I want to stress here that this uh, doesn't reflect on the application's merits um, conceptually, that the positions, the here the protest is uh, about positions that were not funded. Uh, a reflection or a decision before you today doesn't indicate that you think that those positions are not worthwhile. Uh, it just the question before you is about whether or not the county was able to articulate specific reasons of where an error occurred based on law, rule, or specific language in the solicitation. So Multnomah County's protest, uh, they protested the competitive grant. Um, and so as a reminder, there were 15 applicants or 15 applicants for the competitive grant, and we made award notices to all 15 recipients. And then each county had an opportunity to submit a protest. Multnomah County did submit a protest. And because of the competitive nature of the competitive grant, all of the awards to those competitive counties have been placed on hold until these protests can be resolved. And so Multnomah County in their protest, they noted three discrete reasons for why they're protesting. Um, I will go through them one by one, but um, the first one is ling the language used in the solicitation. And I'll note here that my presentation is really just a summary. Um, you have in your packet the full protest letter from Multnomah County. You also have the staff memo covering that. Um, I'll also note here for the record that the Multnomah County's protest memo also includes a section for reconsideration and impacts. Uh, I will not be addressing that today, nor did I address that in the memo because that's not specific to the protest, though there may be information that is useful to the commission as you consider um, how you operate in the future. So for language in the solicitation, um, I'll just read briefly from their protest. They said, the solicitation did not expressly identify a personnel prioritization scheme, which would have informed the development and contents of both the county's formula and competitive grant applications. The use of a prioritization scheme after all grants were submitted violates the provisions of the 2023 grant administration guide and the solicitation for the specific grant. The lack of information disadvantaged applicants applying for both grants. Here I'll note that the solicitation uh, noted that funds must be used to support key personnel, which increase local capacity to engage in a downward departure prison diversion program. Staff did present a to the grant review committee a framework to help them prioritize how to allocate the $7.2 million in funding since the request significantly exceeded that $7.2 million. Uh, total request summed $11.7 million. The framework helped the grant review committee, which uh, determined which requests were key personnel. However, at any point in the process, the grant review committee could have dis discarded the framework. And um, as Commissioner Gordon knows uh, very well, having served on the grant review committee, there was significant discussion about the how to use and whether or not to use that framework in decision making. Um, continuing on around their protest dealing with language in the solicitation, they noted that um, decisions and or recommendations for funding will focus on the application's adherence to goals, priorities, or preferences outlined by legislation or administrative rule, CJC policy, or grant review committees. Um, the Oregon administrative rule, actually, uh, this is somewhat unique to the Justice Reinvestment Program, but our rules specifically direct CJC staff to make recommendations to the Grant Review Committee. Uh, we as CJC staff regularly do make recommendations, including process recommendations to the Grant Review Committee. Ultimately, those recommendations, uh, any recommendations that are sent to the Criminal Justice Commission for final approval, are decided by the voting members of the Grant Review Committee alone. And so uh, we as staff find that this protest dealing with language and solicitation did not identify an error based on law, rule, or solicitation language in the way that the Grant Review Committee used the staff recommended tool to help them make decisions. The second protest that Multnomah County identified was that uh, without funding for two data analyst positions, Multnomah County 
indicated that they will not be able to collect and submit program information related to qualitative progress reports, program data points, outcome measures, or program measures. Uh, in the memo, I noted that to date, all grantees have been able to meet those requirements, regardless of whether the CJC has funded data analyst positions. Um, however, uh, our staff recommendation is that this protest did not identify an error based on law, rule, or solicitation language in the way that the Grant Review Committee and ultimately you, the Commission, chose not to fund the two data analyst positions requested by Multnomah County. The last uh, protest uh, that they um, identified in their memo was that they were they protested the commission's inconsistent governance process, which allowed some candidates to defend or promote applications during commission de de deliberations. Um, the here, as in the memo, I note that law, rule, and grant solicitation are silent on the interaction between the commission and applicants in commission meetings. So while there may be wisdom in the commission adopting transparent policies on how it engages with applicants and grantees, the particulars of this protest do not identify an error based on either law, rule, or language in the solicitation. So in summary, our staff recommendation is that the commission decline the request for a corrective action submitted by Multnomah County uh, we have found that there is no error based on law, rule, or solicitation language identified in the protest. However, of course, this is just our recommendation. You, the Commission, ultimately can make that decision. And I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Ian. All right. I'll open this up for discussion. Carl, Commissioner McPherson. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Solomon or Chair Solomon. Um, based on review of the conflict rules and consultation, I have to declare a conflict, and so I have to abstain from discussion or voting on this topic as I'm a member of the Multnomah County Justice Reinvestment Steering Committee. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Commissioner Norton. Yes, I was wondering if I needed to declare a uh, conflict because I do serve on the Justice Reinvestment Act Grant Review Committee. I'll defer to staff, but I don't believe so. Um, I, I don't believe that would be the case, Commissioner Norton. Um, I mean, you've been involved in the decision making. Um, however, there's no personal benefit either way of this being upheld or not upheld. OK. And I'll just note really quickly in the chat that I see that uh, Commissioner Augsir has also um, declared that he um, will be abstaining. Great. Numbers are shrinking rapidly. All right, uh, Vice Chair Bovet. Uh, I just wanted to make a statement on the record and it'll take 30 seconds or less, and it's my regular hobby horse. We didn't have enough money for JRI because we weren't given enough money for JRI. Um, I complain about this on specialty courts, drug courts, JRI, year in, year out. We need more money for JRI because it's a highly successful and proven program. And I'll stop talking now. I agree more. Uh, Commissioner Norton, you have another comment? I, I do. I'm going to get on my soapbox since um, Vice Chair Bovet led the way. Um, I just want to say that, and I've mentioned this in the JRI Grant Review Committee, that I think we could, um, at least at that level, and probably at this level, could be doing a better job of transparency in who shows up to the meetings, who speaks on behalf of the different counties. Um, I think sometimes that, that that could be patent and that could be tightened up a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Having said that, I don't know. I mean, I'm not convinced that this meets that qualification, but I do want to say that I haven't, I've taken their concerns uh, seriously and hopefully we can remedy some of that. Thank you, and, and I also am interested in thinking about the governance piece to make sure that we are acting with not only transparently, but also with consistency around how we're making our decisions and how we're hearing protests or appeals. Um, so at this point, any other comments about um, the merits of, of this 
protest. Uh, at this point, um, I would uh, entertain um, taking staff's recommendation not to reconsider the protest. Um, but before we do that, I am curious, um, and Ken or Ian, if either one of you have any thoughts about other ways that the CJC might be able to assist Multnomah County, um, because you know clearly this is a program that's um, worthy and has demonstrated um, uh, good outcomes. Uh, if there are other ways that we might be able to um, assist them. Uh, yes, Chair, I'll, I'll take that question. Um, before the protest was filed, I was able to have some conversations with some staff, uh, county staff, about the possibility of leveraging some of our 3% research funds for, um, for at least the data analyst. I think that the GL deputy positions are a bit tougher uh, to find alternatives for, but certainly we're we're committed to working with the county to try to see if we can identify um, other areas where we can be supportive. But I think that the data analyst is one that we could we could certainly find some some means to support. Great, thank you. Um, Ian, would you help us craft a motion? Yes, let me uh, share my slides again. OK. So our recommendation is that the commission decline the request for corrective action submitted by Multnomah County. Great. Is there a commissioner who would be willing to make such a motion? I see you have your hand up, Commissioner Norton. Took it down. Anybody else? I will make that motion. And I'll, this bow that I'll second that motion. All right, we have a motion on the record from Commissioner Freeman, seconded by Vice Chair Bovet. Um, Carol, would you please take the roll? <laughs> so we have Commissioner Auxier abstaining, Commissioner Beach. Yes. Vice Chair Bovet. Yes. Commissioner Freeman. Yes. Commissioner McPherson is abstaining. Commissioner Norton? Yes. And then Chair Solomon? Yes. Then it passes. Great. Next up, uh, we will hear from Rachel MacArthur about the specialty court grant adjustment for Multnomah County's mental health uh, court. It does look oh, like Lisa you, had her hand yeah, up yeah, before. Yeah, I okay. see that. Yep. Go ahead, Commissioner Norton. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to not forget, I don't know if there is a way to put that on the future agenda about how we practice better transparency, how we set some guidance up for all of our grant review committees on how they get feedback or, you know, hear these type of things. And, you know, I don't want to discuss that here because we've got an agenda, but it's something I'd certainly like to discuss in the very near future so we can give that feedback and guidance to the grant review committees. Great, I think we can make that happen. Um, Ken? Uh, certainly, yes, we can make that happen. We'll add that as a future uh, discussion point and we could begin to solicit your ideas on whether that should be something put into administrative rule or just in uh, solicitations or elsewhere, but certainly we will make sure Commissioner Norton to include that. Great, thank you. Right, uh, Ms. MacArthur. Good afternoon, Chair Solomon, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, I'm Rachel MacArthur and I'm staff here at CJC. Uh, today, I'm just going to be presenting to you all an amendment request from the Multnomah County Mental Health Court. Um, and the reason why we are here today is because any request that is to add, remove, or make a substantive change to a grant funded program uh, requires your all's approval. Uh, so the Multnomah Ment or County Mental Health Courts is requesting to reallocate CJC funds um, from a previously approved CADC position to 
fund a second QMHP position. They were approved for one QMHP position um, and they would like to be able to have a second, um, hire a second position. And so um, in response to the grant review committee feedback, um, on adherence to Oregon um, Special Court Standards, they did initially identify um, that CADC position as um, the position that would help them respond um, specifically to that feedback, but also throughout the biennium, help them um, adhere to standards. Uh, as this grant biennium um, has progressed, uh, they did they have recognized a greater need for that second QMHP position um, to adequately address the needs of the participants in the mental health court. Uh, and so <clears throat> they do um, understand the importance of adhering to key standards, and they recognize that taking away money um, from the CADC position may create challenges um, for identifying addiction-related problems. Um, so ad to address this concern, the mental health program Mental Health Court program intends to leverage existing resources available within the Department of Community Justice to monitor and assess drug use patterns of its participants um, and will continually reassess gaps in service delivery. Um, and so staff supports this requested change so that the program can hire um, the, the second um, QMHP position. We did meet with the mental uh, court mental health court team, uh, including the judge, um, to provide some guidance on some um, how to fill in those gaps, how to fill, how to make sure that the resources um, are being utilized so the participants can um, have their needs met, but also as the program progresses through the biennium, that that program is still adhering to um, especially court standards. And that is all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I've got a quick question. So just to be clear, they are asking to reallocate existing uh, monies that were awarded to them. This is not new funding. And um, secondly, uh, what is the amount, uh, the dollar amount that they're asking to move from the CADC position to the QMHP? Yeah, so they were approved for, um, I think it was 113,000 for the CADC position, and they were also uh, were approved to move some admin dollars to also cover the QMHP position. So it really is just the approved $113,000 that they want to reallocate. Uh, great. Uh, any other discussion? Right. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve Multnomah County's request to adjust funding for their mental health court. And I guess I'll question our commissioners, Oxier and McPherson, voting on this or abstaining? I suppose I should abstain. I'm sorry, I, I did not hear Commissioner Oxier. I, I intend to abstain on this. Carl? Um, I, I don't think I need to, so. Mm -hmm. But I, it's me. Commissioner Oxier so, is making uh, me guess, second guess myself now, because I didn't think I had to abstain on there. I didn't think I'd abstain on this one, on this issue. Yeah, so uh, staff, do you want to opine here? I mean, uh, doesn't appear that Carl has a pecuniary interest. Our, our Vice Chair Bovet, maybe you've got some wisdom that you want to share. I don't know that it's wisdom, but um, we have both the state ethics laws, which really get to financial pecuniary benefit or avoidance of detriment to either yourself or your immediate family members and extended family members. But historically at the CJC, we've also been, um, it's not technically required or legal required, but we do honor if a member just doesn't feel comfortable. Like for example, if this was Washington County Mental Health Court, even though I have no involvement in it, I would feel very uncomfortable. And so we, we respect uh, uh, if commissioners want to just not 
abstain because of their comfort level. So that's just been historically what's been done here. But I'm not suggesting you ought to, Carl. It's just we have that history for what it's worth. All right, no, I appreciate that, Vice Chair Bovet. Um, I'll file, follow Commissioner Oxier's lead and abstain on this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, is there someone that would be willing to make a motion that I just stated? Uh, Commissioner Norton? Yes, Chair Solomon. Um, I would move to approve the budget amendment as stated. Great. Is there a second? And Chair, sure, this is uh, Commissioner Beach. I would second. Great. We have a motion by Commissioner Norton, seconded by Commissioner Beach. Um, Rachel, would you please take the roll? I've got you. No, I got you, Rachel. Um, so we have Auxier abstaining, Commissioner Beach. Yes. Vice Chair Bovet. Yes. Commissioner Freeman. Yes. Commissioner McPherson is abstaining. Commissioner Norton. Yes. And Chair Solomon. Yes. All right, it passes. Wonderful. All right. Uh, Last item, well, next last item on the agenda, the 2024 Illegal Marijuana Market Enforcement Grant Program Permanent Rules Filing. And this was the discussion around the definition of nonprofits. And it looks like, Rachel, you'll be taking the lead here as well. Yes. Uh, Chair Solomon, can you see my presentation? Perfect. Yes. Okay. Um, again, for the record, Rachel MacArthur, staff here at CJC. And today um, we're going to be picking up on the discussion um, and the decision to make the temporary illegal marijuana market enforcement grant program rules permanent. Uh, and just kind of as a review of possible decisions before you all today, um, if yes, to make these permanent, um, then it does kick off public notice, public comment period, um, and then they would then become permanent in early March. Um, if no, and you know, holding off, um, we the commission would then um, revisit and revise any rule language, and this could possibly delay um, the opening of the grant solicitation this year, um, depending on how in-depth those proposed revisions may be. I apologize about the amount of text on this slide, um, but this is where we left off last time um, that we met. And I want to direct you specifically, um, as Chair Solomon, um, said to the uh, definition of community-based organizations on the bottom of this slide. Um, last time we met, you all asked staff to review and research um, for a standard state agency definition of community-based organizations. Uh, and they're specific to grant programs. And we did not find a standard definition. Uh, the definitions that we reviewed were broader and they also differed based on the needs and purposes of the grant program. Uh, and so with that, um, we relied on input from Commissioner Bovet for the definition that you see on this slide. Uh, let's see Commissioner Bovet, uh, followed by Commissioner Freeman. So I'll just um, add, since I guess I'm the one who primarily crafted this, that I was trying to recraft what we had kind of crafted really fast, kind of um, down and quick 
when we initially did this program um, back in the day. Um, so I've, I've reread this and I still like it, but I just want to call out that this would really confine things to 501c3s and uh, other nonprofits that work with the 501c3. Uh, I'm actually good putting this out there for publication, seeing if anybody ha thinks that's too broad, too narrow, you know, what, what folks would want for this particular program. But um, that's that was my quick comment. I'm I'm good with publishing this. I could tweak it a million different ways, but uh, there's my comment. Great, thank you, uh, Commissioner Freeman. So thank you, and thank you for trying to define this. It's sort of interesting that you know we start out with the idea of it, you know, wanting to make sure these dollars are spent correctly in these programs through CBOs, and then B says. Any group that can get a CBO to kind of sponsor them is okay too. So I kind of question what's the need to have the CBO if we're kind of doing any group. But I'm okay with the way it is, but it certainly broadens out uh, who might be eligible to use this, this grant program. Uh, Commissioner Bobet, do you have any thoughts about that? No, that's why I'd be interested in in, in the commentaries, because like um, as as uh, Commissioner Freeman pointed out, A would actually, you know, include all the various types of 501Cs, but it would say you got to be kind of, I don't want to say legit, because you can be legit even without the determination letter, but you, you're finished, you're ready to go. You are a 501C3, C6, C7, C8, whatever is, you're ready to go. Or B was included because our previous rule Kind of allowed some nonprofits to grab a charity, a 501c3 that was willing to lend their c3 status. I think that is somewhat common, but I'm not even sure of that anymore. But I, I when I crafted this, I didn't add B. It was more of a reflection of what is already in the existing temporary rule, just more correctly written. But maybe that's too broad. I don't know. Um, and so I, I hear Commissioner Freeman's question and concern, but uh, we could remove B or we could put it out there like this and see what people say. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of curious what other state agencies are doing um, and whether we've looked at other grant making agencies uh, around this particular issue or even philanthropic foundations. Um, do our staff aware of what practices are with other state agencies? Yeah, Chair Solomon, I do have some examples um, of other state agencies and their definitions. Um, mm -hmm. If it's, I, I don't know how I can, I have them kind of on a, um, just in a Word document. I can share that Word document if you'd like, or I can read them out to you all. Kind of just depends on what you would prefer me to do. If you'd like to see them. Um, if you could share screen, that would be great. I can do that. Just tell us if other agencies allow people to kind yeah. of tag on. Most of the definitions that we found are a lot more broad. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, can um, you blow it up a little bit? Yeah. Let me... That's better. Does yeah. that work? Can you all see yeah. that? And then I can scroll down as you need to to read other ones. Well, they really are pretty broad. This is not an exhaustive list, but we did look at a few of them just to kind of get an idea of other states. Most agencies. of them use the term nonprofit. But it looks like they're not even requiring them to be 501c3s. Right. right. You're right. Um, okay. Uh, Commissioner Bobat. Um, now I fully understand Rachel's earlier comment about context matters. Um, I can see where, um, based on some of these agencies, the context would be totally different. Uh, the yeah. context we're in here is we're granting out substantial dollars. Um, 
And to me, that's a different context than regulating uh, an entity. Um, so while I hear Commissioner Freeman's concern about maybe how broad what I crafted in the in, in the B part, these would all be much more broad. And I, I think we would potentially get grant applications from entities that aren't even really um, yeah. Maybe yeah. they're operating under Oregon law, but I don't know about federal law. You know, I, I just I worry about I worry about it, using something this broad. No, I don't think any of these definitions are, are are worth replicating. I guess the question I have is whether or not we include B altogether or just get rid of it. Um, you know, have there been instances in the past uh, Re related to other grant making that the CJC has done where organizations have applied using a fiscal sponsor. And Ken, I see you, you've got your hand up. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, I didn't raise my hand specifically to that question, but I can say that to my knowledge, we have not encountered that before, but also the history of grant making at CJC outside of county or other governmental organizations is pretty thin. And so I, I wouldn't say that it, it could not happen. What, what I would love to, to, to discuss for a second, if, if, if I could, is that we do actually have, to muddy the waters, a community-based organization uh, definition that we passed for restorative justice that I am going to put in the chat just as a reminder, um, perhaps going towards consistency um, within our rulemaking, but I also just wanted to note that um, this definition that, that I just put into the chat, you'll see also includes the consideration of of the agent of the applicant being a nonprofit or an organization with a nonprofit fiscal sponsor. When we engaged with the restorative justice community and nonprofit folks in our rulemaking process for that grant, I, I know I went into it and, our, and CJC staff went into it just assuming that nonprofits would be the only types of organizations that would apply for these grant dollars. But we were told by folks on that committee that there are actually very limited instances where, where an organization may choose not to be a nonprofit for various reasons and could still actually be um, an appropriate um, applicant for these funds. And so I just, as far as feedback is concerned, we've heard that. I'm not an expert at all in organizational, um, you know, the legalities of organizations. And so I'm not really sure beyond my recollection of those discussions. The other thing I do want to point out is that even if um, an organization is eligible to apply, they will still go through our grant review committee process. And so if we do see an organization that does not appear to be appropriate for various reasons, simply being eligible to apply does not guarantee funding um, by any means. But I just wanted to at least put all of that on the record and, um, and, and just to make sure that that previous work that we've done as a commission um, is passed on to folks who are new. <laughs> okay. Um, well, part of me feels like we're trying to create a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. Um, uh, okay, I'll hold off the rest of my comments. Com uh, Commissioner Norton. I'm sorry. I The only thing I, and I've been pondering and I have not been able to find the information myself, is I, I work for a tribe, but I don't necessarily know that A, tribes would be appropriate for this kind of funding, but also B, that they would be considered a 501c anything uh, because they're a governmental entity. So I don't know if they would fall under the community-based organization. Just trying to throw that out there um, to just for uh -huh. consideration. I don't want to inadvertently eliminate somebody because they don't have this uh, 501c designation. Um, but I also don't want to get in the business of determining whether something's a CBO or not um, without some kind of objective measuring you know, marker. Yeah, well, you know, for the sake of consistency, I like us kind of having the same language. And so if we're using um, community based organization and including tribal affiliated organization for restorative justice, it probably makes sense for us to do that elsewhere. Um, do others have thoughts about that? Chair Solomon. 
um, mm-hmm. if I may. Um, that, so the original definition of for this particular grant um, was very similar to the I, the, our, the restorative justice definition um, with the change of removing tribal based um, the, the tribes, not because of, of tribal CBOs to, to Commissioner Norton's point, but um, but they there was not so just to ensure that there wasn't any ambiguity as to whether or not tribal governments can be recipient of these these funds. Um, so statute doesn't allow for awards to tribal governments at this time. So that is well, why there's perfect. that difference That's in helpful. definition. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, I, I could really go either way on this around B. Um, I, I think at this point I would probably lean towards publishing and seeing what kind of feedback we get. And and can someone walk me through kind of what that process looks like? What the next steps are? Yeah, Chair Solomon. So if this uh, if you all vote today to approve, we do have two other definitions after this on slides. If you do all if you if you vote yes um, to make these permanent, we can then um, essentially set them off for public record and public comment. Um, it is. 49 days, so about seven weeks, where that process, um, they're just out there for comment and feedback. And then if nothing, um, no revisions are made or anything like that, they then become permanent at the end of that um, 49 days. Uh, and then for, for CJC staff at that point, we can then start developing the solicitation and move on with the, the grant program. Okay. Um, do you want to walk through the others? Sure. Unless there are other comments that folks have about A and B. All right. Okay, so this um, is to expand the program's purpose to include addressing the ongoing um, illegal marijuana worker abuse humanitarian crisis. Uh, and so this includes uh, the definition of humanitarian crisis. Um, when this rule was originally written, uh, staff at CJC did engage with DOJ and their um, uh, trafficking task force that was um, assembled at the time to get feedback on um, uh, making this definition accurate. Okay, um, continue on please. Okay, and then um, the last one is essentially, it's the trauma-informed preference. Uh, and in reviewing grant applications, um, the commission may give preference to applications that demonstrate that an applicant will provide access to trauma-informed and culturally and linguistically specific responsive services to persons affected by the ongoing humanitarian crisis associated with the illegal marijuana market. All right, um, any other comments from commissioners about these proposed rules? All right. Um, Go ahead, Commissioner Bovat. I didn't see any other hands raised, so I would um, just make a motion to approve of these proposals and um, direct staff to publish them in accordance with the APA. Great. Is there a second? Chair, uh, Commissioner Beach, I would do that. Second. Thank you. Right, we have a motion uh, made by Vice Chair Bovet, seconded by Commissioner Beach to approve the uh, program rules. Uh, would you please take roll, Carol? Commissioner Augzier? Yes. Commissioner Beach? Yes. Vice Chair Bovet? Yes. Commissioner Freeman? No. I think this is when, was that him? 
Yeah, I think the he was going to. No, no, no. Yes. Okay. Can you not hear me? I've got no, you. We heard you. Thank you. Commissioner McPherson. Yes. Commissioner Norton. Yes. And then Chair Solomon. Yes. Then it passes. All right. And then our last item of business is agency updates. Thank you, Chair. Just a few updates for the Commission today. Um, the first is I just wanted to let folks know that right now we are tentatively planning to have our March Commission meeting in person. Um, and we are hoping to have that in Multnomah County. Uh, more info and details to come um, on that in the next week or two. Um, second, I wanted to let folks know um, someone who you've seen on some of our presentations before, um, Alex Bichelle, who is currently one of our exec team members and our operations manager, is uh, departing the agency um, at the beginning of next month. Um, he's been snatched up by the Bureau of Labor's, Labor and Industries to be their operations manager. Um, so we're currently in, in the works trying to find a replacement for him, but just wanted to let you all know that. Um, and last, I did just want to flag for folks that there are a number of our programs that are um, under discussion in the upcoming short session, um, hopefully for uh, funding and other types of changes. Um, so the ones I'll just point out is that we did submit as an agency a letter requesting additional funding um, through uh, the next session for our restorative justice program. I've heard positive things about that so far, and so I'm very hopeful there, um, but certainly I will not count any chickens until the session is over. Um, in addition to that, we know that there have been some discussions uh, in the speaker's office and also in the legislature about uh, specialty courts and particularly specialty court funding and the significant gap that we encountered uh, this past biennium in requests versus what we could actually fund. And I'm also cautiously optimistic that we may receive an infusion of funds during a short session for that as well. And then finally, our impacts grant program has been the subject of some discussions through the Measure 110 um, groups that have been working uh, through the Joint Addiction Committee as well. And so um, I just wanted to flag that we have a number of items under discussion uh, within the building. More updates to come, um, particularly in our, our February meeting, if things are beginning to move, but I wanted to put that on everybody's radar um, that we may have um, additional work to do um, after short session concludes. Great. Um, any questions for Ken? Well, I will tell you, it always pleases me to no end when we uh, get done with a meeting early, no less uh, 37 minutes early. Uh, so unless there are any other comments, I will uh, adjourn the meeting and bid you all uh, a good day and give you the rest of your time back. Thank you all. Thank you, you all have a good day.